take no loss. Yeah, I don't even know what it costs. Yeah, I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, yeah, run it, run it. Ooh, I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Did you miss us? Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the morning show, Stock Market TV. Spencer Israel, JC Perez, Steve Straza is in transit right now. Uh, but you got two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. And um, we got a lot to, to get to. Obviously, we've been out. We've been in New York for the past few days for our very first in-person portfolio accelerator event. It went amazing. We'll talk more about that. Um, we got a lot to discuss, though. Obviously, we missed a lot in the markets. Well, we, we didn't miss it. We just weren't here to discuss it with you. So, uh, yeah, a lot going on. Mike Singleton is today's guest. He will join us at 9. And I don't, even, I don't even know what day today is. Is today Thursday? I think it's Thursday. I don't know. Uh, so, good morning, chat. We missed you. Jason, Chef, Jim, Mark. Uh, let's see. Diverse Insight. Chris, Nicholas. What up, y'all? Hope you missed us, too. Let's go. Oh, Spencer Israel, what'd you think? What? Not bad, huh? Not bad, not bad. Not bad. A, a a good time has been had, but all good things must come to an end. So we're back in the saddle. We had our portfolio accelerator over the last couple of days. Um, so uh, some traders and investors came to join us. If you're uh, interested in the portfolio accelerator, definitely reach out to Mary. But other way. Um, you know, we got all the analysts and the traders in from out of town. Sean Straza, Fonz came in from Venezuela, uh, Louis in from New Zealand, Ian Cully in the house. That was a lot of fun. What was your favorite part? Um, I well, I feel I think the cliched answer is to say the dinner. So I, I'm not going to say the dinner. I'm going to say the fact that as a team, Which dinner, we don't Monday all or get Tuesday. To uh tuesday but um <laughs> no nah, man monday monday i i was too bloated uh the uh, i the fact that we don't get together as a team in person very often i mean a couple of us got together in october and then really we had a our last big gathering though was last was may of last year so just just to see everybody in person um honestly it it rejuvenates you um Sometimes I, I wish that we weren't a fully remote company. We all live together so we can more, see each other more more regularly because it, it is inspiring and, and, it, and it gets it gets it gets your 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 head spinning with ideas and and it makes you want to go home and and t and take on the world right when, when you actually get together and in person like this. So so just seeing everyone and getting together and and uh, I wish we could do it more. But that was my favorite part. What about you? Um, yeah, you know, it's a cop out answer, but you know, really hanging out with everybody. Um, yeah. you know, the party bus on Monday night going to different pizza joints. That was a good time. The, the party bus, uh, man. Yeah. For those. Yeah. I mean, for pe most people weren't there, uh, but we rented a party bus and drove around Manhattan and some Brooklyn for that matter. That uh, cool. just eating pizza. That was great. That was fantastic. Eating pizza. That was great. Uh, all right, let's get into the markets. Hit it, baby. Here yeah. Oh. Uh, we just had GDP too, so maybe we'll talk about that. I don't know. We'll see. I can't even spell it. All right. So to me, you know, for uh, you know, we were we were talking about markets, uh, you know, quite a bit over the last you know few days, and and the whole idea, you know, we have these weekly team meetings, you know, that usually last about an hour, hour and change. You know, we're informally having meetings throughout the week as well. Uh, but, you know, we really had the time to go over everything. We covered stocks, interest rates, commodities, Forex, crypto, individual stock ideas, options trades around those stock ideas. You know, we talked about old ideas that we had that worked, some that didn't work. We talked about some of the, the, the different strategies that we're trying to implement more. A big theme over the last couple of days was being more greedy. 
letting our winners run longer uh, is one of those uh, is, is one was, was probably the biggest theme over the last couple of days. That's as far as like our team is concerned. As far as the market is concerned, you know, S and P down, Nasdaq continue to make new all time highs. Throw up slide one here, Spencer, because this one is um, you know very characteristic of healthy market environments. Strong uptrends. Uh, in black, we're looking at consumer staples relative to the rest of the market. As this continues to make new lows, it's consumer staples underperforming. In other words, the most defensive group having a hard time keeping up with the rest of the market. That's perfectly normal for bull markets. In bear markets, these lines go up. Go up in black, you're looking at consumer staples, right? Uh, cigarettes, booze, uh, you know, canned goods. Right, toothpaste, toilet paper, consumer staples—things that you're gonna you're gonna need regardless of whether we're in a recession or a great economy. It doesn't matter. So, so those defensive areas tend to get a relative bid when stocks are under pressure. Same thing with low volatility. It's really an extension of the same thing. Low volatility stocks, again, defensive, tend to do well. Tend to outperform when stocks are under pressure. Staples making new multi-decade lows yesterday relative to the rest of the market, like nothing. Like there is no bid for these things at all, which, you know, if we would have seen some relative outperformance in consumer staples, that would, you know, that would have been kind of okay. We didn't even get that. Nothing, new lows. Uh, All-time low uh, for the low volatility index relative to the S&P 500. So again, when stocks are under pressure, these lines go up. Uh, healthy market environments, these lines go down. And of course, lines have been going down uh quick look uh any any thoughts there spencer well i i feel like i've probably said this exact same thing before but wouldn't wouldn't it be better for this exercise to see the equal weight version uh sure um so it's rsps relative to rsp right right so rsps relative to rsp uh, new lows. Let's see how far back this data goes for some of these ETFs. You know, we're back down to the to the late 2021 lows. Um, so I wouldn't say it's necessarily better that the okay. uh, to look at the equally weighted index versus the cap weighted index because we live in a cap weighted world, whether people like it or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's just that's just the way it is, right? Um, but so, so but again, the, the, another the, another good theme that we talked about a lot over the last couple of days, Spencer, is that whole thing about doing both, right? Yeah. And this is that. We're doing both. Yeah. So the conclusion here is that um, – and actually we're getting this reinforced in the uh, economic data this morning. Uh, the conclusion here is that uh, we are not in a recession. That, uh, what the, the serial killer say. thought that we were in a recession? Well, all right, maybe I should I should have rephrased. It's not that we're not in a session. It's that the economy is actually doing quite well, contrary to what some people will tell you. Uh, the market is doing you well. Think the the stock, is doing well. people think the stock market is stupid? Uh, there like the economy is doing well, right? Have you wrong? seen the stock market? You know, not you. Just yeah, yeah. There are people that think the market is wrong, as always. Um, um, the market is not wrong. You know, uh, by the way, I just I just kind of ran the numbers. New all time lows for the equally weighted consumer staples relative to the equally weighted S&P 500. So the same thing that you're seeing. And in this case, by the way, you know, people talk about consumer discretionaries as being sort of top heavy. Amazon, you know, uh, Tesla, Home Depot, big components. Um, staples are pretty top heavy, too. Not as, not as, not as top but, heavy. You know, but look, 14 percent is the largest holding. So but that's not five holdings. What? Look at that. 14% Procter and Gamble, 12% Costco. Throw up the chart. Oh, yeah, you got it up. Um, so 14% uh, Procter and Gamble, 12% Costco, almost 10% Pepsi, 9% Coca Cola, right? So just those top four, you're talking 45% of the index. And then in consumer discretionary, the top four is about 50% of the index. So it's really not that different, you know? Um, the, uh, the the discretionary is a little more top-heavy on the top two. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But 
You know why? It's because there's no tech in Staples. <laughs> what? It's because it's because there's no tech, right? Well, like in in the other sectors, there's tech. Let's be honest. There's tech. There's no tech. In here. There's no maybe maybe um uh you can make an argument. No, you can't. Never Nike? mind. Nike. <laughs> Nike's not using some tech. McDonald's. Well, yeah, they're all using tech, right? McDonald's. But no one here has 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 the tech multiple. Maybe Costco actually. Um, but yeah, they don't trade like tech. Um. So. Okay. What else? Uh. What else do you think stood out in the uh? In the portfolio accelerator oh from the last two days oh my gosh so much um my my favorite presentation was was actually at, sort of at the, at the end of yesterday which was louis presentation about the etfs um I told you uh, man how valuable is that he he had some really good charts about you know using the etf at um as a signal and also just as as an as a source of ideas so so we looked at jets right and I normally would never look at Jets because I know what the Jets chart looks like, right? Because it's been a, it's been a piece of garbage for a long time. Um, but he had some some really good charts, just looking w under the surface. And anyone can go look at the holdings of Jets, but he had some really good charts that showed sort of the dispersion of returns within Jets. And just because um, an ETF might suck doesn't necessarily mean all the airlines suck. For example, right? Uh, so that was. That was very valuable to me. Um, I never this seen is, that sort of that data. This particular exercise that we're uh, doing more of, you know, and and doing more on the ETFs and and Louis broke down. I wanted four scans. I think we got like seven of them. Yeah. Well, there there will be more. Don't worry. There there, there will be you more. You think yeah, so? We, we didn't have time. We we didn't have time. We it was. I know, but you think there's going to the be the more? Day, we didn't have time. Ow. So you got so you got the indexes, which is not one of the ones that I had considered, but I'm glad that he included that. So it's like MDY for yep. mid caps, SPY, QQQ, yep. IWM. Honestly, it wasn't because we do a good job of that, but I guess he he, he took it another step further and organized that. Mm -hmm. So I really like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Sectors, you know, not just the eleven, but down the cap scale, the mid cap uh, sectors, the small cap sectors. Fantastic job, Louis. Uh, the industry groups as well. You know, regional mm -hmm. banks, biotechnology, you know, airlines. These are regional. Uh, these are regional. These are uh, sub industry groups within a sector. You know, like in healthcare, mm -hmm. you got biotechs, pharma, managed health, medical devices. In financials, you got broker dealers, capital markets, regional banks, insurance stocks. These are vastly different types of companies and industries within the same sector. Yep. So that's a good one. And of course, the country, uh, every country. Um, I got a good question for the chat because this was a heavily debated and we couldn't agree. And I really want to know your thoughts. So we have every single country ETF in the world, right? In one group. And then we have another group that's all thematic ETFs. So like different themes, like maybe like an arc or, uh, you know, clean energy or whatever. What about Chinese internet and Chinese tech? Should those be included in the thematic scan or should they be included just in the countries? Because no other countries have these, so it's just two more. So I say you just toss it in with the rest of the countries. Some of the other guys said it's thematic. What do you guys think? Anybody out there? Yeah, I like it the, in the, the countries. The, the, this is what this happens when you get a bunch of nerds in the same room together. They start debating whether an ETF is thematic or or should go with the rest of the the in the, the international. T man says country. ETFs, I agree. So. I agree. What so, about right. uh, hold well, on? What few, about the uh, hedge? A, a few of us, Strauss and I, said both both said uh, thematic. You said country. Yeah. Look, everybody's saying country. Um, and then what about hedged Europe and hedged Japan? So those are the the country ETFs priced in local currency. Also yeah, should thought, be in I the thought, country. I thought we agreed that those were those are country. Those should be in yeah, the country. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Okay, so what else? Um, Blake is asking what. What were the risks that people were most worried about? That's a great question, Blake. Um, Consumer staples, rallying, relative, yeah. low volatility stocks, was one. rallying, relative, credit spreads widening, and the dollar rallying. No, I'm trying to think what 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 people besides like I I know what was in the presentations, but what were like the you know the people talking about? Um, um i think it was those oh, stuff man. i don't think anybody brought up anything else what what else yeah i'm trying to think i don't know hey do you want to talk about the uh the informal 
survey you did during dinner on Tuesday were you, night. Were you taking note of the answers? Because I was a little inebriated by that it, point. It was very. It was hard to take notes because everyone just people were just raising their hands. But uh, um, it seemed okay. So the first question was S and P five hundred. So hold on. Why don't you um, paint the picture? So we had about yeah. what forty people there. It was like 35, 35 people. 40 people yeah. there, including our analysts, a lot of a lot of friends. Um, who was there? Frank Capillaire, a lot of friend, uh, familiar faces of the show. Katie Stockton, Barry Ritholtz, Todd Gordon. Jan Van Eck swung by. Jan Van Eck was there. Uh, Great guy. Frank Capillaire, Todd Gordon, Todd Sohn. You know, we had uh, we had quite the crew. Yeah. We had the CFO of Benzinga. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good egg. Good egg, Robert. Um. Uh, so, you know, we said a few words, kind of had a few laughs, everybody ate and drank. And then towards the end, when things were quieting down a little bit, you know, before desserts, by the way, I didn't get any dessert, which I'm still upset about. Me neither, but that's okay. It's okay. How did I miss the dessert? You, we, we will both survive. I had, I had, ice, I had extra ice cream the night before. Uh, but so anyway, so I'm, I, I asked everybody, I was like, listen, we got a lot of smart, a lot of smart minds, people with opinions is, is was kind of what I said. People with opinions are here. So why don't we uh, why don't we do a little survey? So it was like S and P. It was a lot of mix. It was like S and P higher or lower by the end of the year, gold higher or lower, interest rates above or below four uh, percent, China outperforming U.S. or underperforming U.S. A lot of mixed hands. What answer to the, each of those surveys was most surprising? What stood out? Um, I'm trying to remember what the room was most split on. The room was it was pretty consensus on the S and P being higher. I think maybe one or two people said lower, right? Um, group was I think that maybe uh, they were most split. Perhaps on oil was pretty split. You asked oil, what'd you say, a hundred or fifty? What do we hit first, a hundred or fifty? I think the room was somewhat split on that. Maybe it was no, it was more. A, it was like three, four fifths, a hundred. Why don't you get Giancarlo? I remember what like get Giancarlo to snip that that whole thing out. And I'm trying to remember what the most like divisive question was um, among the group. Uh, you asked about uh, rates. You asked about. Uh, trying to, I, I think I think the room was surprisingly consensus. On which right? one rates? I, I, on on most of them. I, we need to go check the tape because I had already had yeah. a few too many at that point. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, it's check the tape. Tell John Carlo and... to snip it. Well, actually, we could put it on the show so we could all watch it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that. That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. We'll we'll snip it out. Um, but the room was. I remember the first question was S and P five hundred. Uh, whatever you ask, higher, higher or lower, and like the room was like near basically unanimous yeah. higher <laughs> yeah. yeah well there's a lot of like uh price oriented yeah. people in that room of yeah, course, yeah of course um yep. all right so we'll get john carter to clip that we'll watch it let's just do a quick little rundown on the market we got yeah. the dow futures up 60 points this morning s p i found her futures up about 16 handles 30 basis points nasdaq futures up 50 basis points about 80 points uh bond futures up uh, you know, something else interesting, bonds uh, making new one-month lows this week while stocks were doing really well. That's something that came up. Uh, gold flat, silver flat, copper flat, uh, oil up a percent, natty gas up 5%, and the dollar down, rolling over. Uh, that's really, you know, front and center for me because, you know, credit spreads are as tight as they've been. You know, uh, consumer staples, low volatility, making new relative lows. So if there's anything that's like, you know, what can you know, start, you know, put, put some pressure on the market. It's going to be the dollar. And let me just finish up quickly, uh, Spencer, yeah. uh, here in the funny money, Bitcoin, uh, sitting just under 40,000, uh, pretty flat on the day, uh, Ethereum, uh, right around 2,200 down about a percent, uh, and Solana, of course, um, you know, down towards 86, right? So that, that one's taken quite the correction. Now, obviously that one had a monster move higher total crypto market cap down to 1.5 trillion. I was pushing 1.7 just last week. The the uh, going back to the to the dinner, the China question was actually the room was pretty split on China. A lot of people were like coming in, buying the call on the bottom, bottom bottom fishing in China. Yeah, right? that makes sense. I mean, there's, yep. I mean, who knows what's happening there? Uh, we were buying yep. China a couple of days ago uh, live, you know, yes, with everybody. Yes, you were. Yes, 
Yes, you were. So let's see if that if we get some uh, follow through. Hey, hey, it, it, don't look now. It's been a good couple of days. It has. <laughs> Knock on wood. It has. It has. <laughs> I mean, listen, you know, from a sentiment standpoint, when you start to see people who never once have ever mentioned the Hang Seng Index, talking about the Hang Seng every day, yeah, uh, word's gotten out. Word's gotten out. Probably want to start taking the other side. So that's what we did. Uh, I should mention, uh, in light of the rundown JC just gave, we, we had GDP this morning, uh, Q4 GDP. This is the first reading up 3.3% versus a 2% estimate. So a very handed beat on that number uh, sort of reinforces the idea that uh, we perhaps are ready for uh, the Fed to uh, lower rates. So uh, Who, who's yeah. we? We, the economy. Yeah. The economy is ready. The economy is ready for the Fed to lower rates because GDP sucks. GDP did not suck. GDP came in higher. So then, why why would they lower rates? Uh, because it, it because they've they've done they've done their job and and it's time to you know it, it it's time to maybe uh, ease up a little. And bit. And they've done their job. What controlling inflation? Uh, well, this is not a measure of inflation, of course. But well, I know, but you uh, said the Fed. Has the Fed's ahead. done hiking. Uh, they did their job, meaning they 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 took care of inflation. That's what you mean? Yeah, I mean inflation has been coming down. This is this is sort of a, another feather on the cap for the the soft landing argument. So, you know, what is it that's landing? Uh, we are as a group. We were up. We were high on money, and now we're uh, now we're lower. Yeah, but the stock market is at an all time high, though. I know. Yeah, but there was money. There was there, there was helicopter money, right? So we were all high on the, heli the helicopter money. I guess from a couple years ago. I guess. Um. Anyway, okay. Um. We're gonna have Mike Singleton on in five minutes. Nice. Uh. And uh, I'm not sure if you brought charts for us. I'll have to check. Going, Mike. He's probably uh, got case, some charts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In any case, uh, obviously, um, you guys know that I was keeping tabs uh, on earnings. Uh, huge, huge earnings week. Uh. This week and next. Next week is probably bigger. But we had, let's see, just in the last couple of years when we had no show, right? We missed talking about Netflix. Uh, a lot of conversations were had about uh, shorting Tesla into earnings uh, the past couple of days. Um, that would have worked for you, um, at least last I checked. Yeah, it's right around um, 190, which is the, uh, we're, we're, we're short those puts uh, on, the, uh, on that iron condor that we put on. So, I'm really curious to see how Tesla closes because if it closes below 190, we're going to go ahead and unwind that trade. So it's right around 190 right now. So let's see where we close. Yep. Um, I, I I I looked the other day and uh, I think so. This this well, I don't know what Tesla's down this morning. It's down nine percent. Five percent. Okay. Nine. So the last nine. Oh, that's interesting because that makes four quarters in a row now that Tesla has fallen nine percent. Uh, in, in, yeah, in but in each of those other ones, gap. it closed the day down nine percent. Do I have that right? Uh, yeah, okay, you're right. The market hasn't even opened yeah, yet. You're right. You're right. Uh, but the gap wasn't much better, so the opening gap is all I'm saying. Oh. So, um, interesting. So yeah, we had a lot obviously this week. Um, um, no, none bigger than Tesla and, and Netflix, obviously, but nonetheless, a lot happening on the earnings front, and then we can get through this, and uh, Sean can be happy to put on more options trades, and you. No, oh, I like that. What else? What else did we miss? You know, we were talking. You know, we were busy over the last couple of days. Uh, anything that uh, we didn't talk about? Um, you know, as far as like uh, big news, earnings. Well, Microsoft hitting three trillion. Microsoft yesterday. hitting three trillion. So is Microsoft the first three trillion dollar company, or did Apple get there? No, 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 no Apple. I I don't think Microsoft is still is still there. It's two point nine nine two. Yeah, yeah. But it's up almost a percent pre market, so that'll get it there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it will. Oh, Apple's right um, now at three trillion. Uh, Meta, Meta cross one trillion. That's fun. Yeah. Um. No, but as far as far as broad, like broad macro stuff, I mean, I think it's not like we weren't like you know our heads weren't in the sand. No, like we were. We all had our laptops. So, so there's nothing that we like quote unquote missed in the last couple of days because we we were we were here for it all. Um. I know Steve wants to talk about there was like a really obscure IPO, I think last Friday. We'll talk about that tomorrow when Steve's back. It was, um, we had like a, a Kazakhstan fintech company go public. Really? Um, yeah. They got um, those? You know, because Kazakhstan is the hotbed, the new hotbed of fintech. Who knew? Apparently. 
Yeah, right. So we'll, we'll save that for Steve tomorrow. He wants to he wants to talk about that. Um, gosh, what else? I mean, there's of course there was like a bunch of news. There's there's always news, but uh, you know, all of it noise, right? Um, like what? Uh, a lot of there's a lot of Boeing headlines in the last every day now. There's there's like three Boeing headlines because everyone between the CEOs and the government bodies, they're all saying things. So, um, yeah, just a lot of headline risk there. There was a headline that uh, the the C- the CEO of Alaska Airlines came out and said that they this is this is from several days ago now that they found uh, quote uh, many loose bolts uh, on on their planes. Many from, loose from bolts. The, That's that, which airline many. is this? This is Alaska. Ooh, that's not good. Many, many loose bolts. So not, not generally you want to see fewer loose bolts on your planes, I think. Uh, or none. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, all right. Why don't we bring on Mike Singleton and, um, and, and then we'll hang out. Nice. Jay, we've Make. been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. It's a nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Hey, Mike. What's going on, my man? Hey, JC. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Dude, this is great. You know, we, uh, you know, we just spent a couple of days together in the city. Uh, a lot of eating, a lot of drinking, a lot of charts. A lot of charts. Um Fewer charts than I thought, Spencer. I, I never thought those words would come well, out of my mouth. You know mouth. what, though? I was looking at the deck, and the deck is not complete. It hasn't been uh, – the decks have not been merged yet, so I don't have a true number. It's under 1,000, um, which is – I didn't see that coming. Is under 1,000, you said? I think so. Oh. Uh, well, I, yeah. <laughs> they haven't been merged. Under 1,000, so Mike. Can you believe true. that? You know, you're get, getting lazy. It really is a bull market. That's right. That's right. Line go up. Um, you know – Mike, talk to me. You know, we we continue to, to drive higher. Uh, Dow, S and P, Nasdaq all making new all time highs. Consumer staples on a relative basis, low volatility on a relative basis, keep falling. Dollar remains muted. Credit spreads as tight as they've been. Um, you know, it's been a raging bull market for arguably eighteen months. Um, does it does it have legs? Do we continue to grind higher all year? Uh, is a is a massive correction imminent? Like I keep being told. Uh, I would say no. I think you. I think you have to be bullish here. So uh, fundamentally, what's changed is that I think the Fed has pulled an all-out pivot. Uh, the December thirteenth meeting, Chair Powell basically gave his imprimatur to the easing of financial conditions that we've seen. Is that fundamentals, to, Mike? Uh, well, to be honest, it, I don't think that there's a big difference between the technicals and the fundamentals, but maybe that's a different conversation, right? Is the price of oil a fundamental cost input into every consumer good ever, or is it a technical variable or credit spreads the cost of borrowing, or is it the difference between high yield performance and treasuries? You know, all of these things are interest rates. If, you know, is a 10 year yield, the cost of a 10 year note, or is it the benchmark rate for the 30 year fixed mortgage rate? Like technicals are fundamentals. It's all the same thing. I think it's kind of a it's kind of an unimportant distinction in my mind. How uh, politically correct of you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's not my intention. That was, I just that, think that, that, that was a politician's answer serious. right there. Yeah, serious. Sometimes people running for governor down there. <laughs> um, okay, fair. Um, okay, so you have to be bullish. Bullish what? I think you have to be taking more risk, whatever that means. I think that means more cyclical risk. I think that means net exposure on the higher end of whatever your spectrum is. The only big risk ex- taking you know more credit risk within your fixed income portfolio. The only big risk factor that I would say I'm not edging bullish on is duration, right? I don't think that you want to buy long term bonds here. Why not? Yeah. Uh, you, well, you don't want to buy long term bonds. Because well, you think the short answer is because I think the economy is reaccelerating, so you want to be buying productive assets, not unproductive assets. And moreover, there are a number a number of technical factors that I think are going to be pushing yields up including nearly a 7% budget deficit in 2024, including, you know, the, the drawdown in the reverse repo facility, including the fact that eventually the treasury will have to start issuing more long-term bonds as a percentage of its, um, you know, issues that it has to finance the government with. And all of that puts up, and, you know, beyond that, I think inflation is probably going to edge up between three and 4% by the end of the year. So I don't think that there's a ton of room for the tenure to go lower from here. So rates higher. 
Long rates higher. Yeah, I think so. 30s. 30s higher. Yeah. How high? Uh, I think it'll stay contained. I think it'll be sub 5% until the end of the year. Um, so I think interest rates won't pose a problem for stocks, but you're not going to get paid buying long bonds. You know, we, we talk about the rate of change uh, of the bond market, okay. you know, and it, it's it's the, the, the pace in which those rates are changing that the stock market doesn't like. It's not higher or lower. If it goes higher slowly or lower slowly, you know, stock market's cool with that. It's it's the big fast moves in either direction. So if you're right, I mean, and we we edge higher throughout the year, kind of remain messy. It's probably good for stocks, right? Right. So I think that not to get too too fundamental on you, but I think the Treasury has enough wiggle room in terms of uh, its issuance mix, its issuance mix that it can continue to issue more bills and fewer bonds over the next six months or nine months. And uh, that means less supply of duration on the market relative to what there would otherwise be. And that's why we expect the tenure to remain sort of uh, sort of contained, modest, right? You know, less supply, all else equal means um, uh, lower yields, you know, higher what's prices. Gonna, what, what's going to be, the, demand, right? be the best performing sector this year? Well, that, I was going to ask, in, in terms of risk, is it just... And any any risk asset, they're not. So I think equal. I think you want to be. Utilities, not staples. Right. right. I think you. I think the worst performing will probably be like utilities or staples. I think the again, best performing again stay. They stay sucking. I think so. At least for the first six months of the year. After the first six months, I still expect it to be a good year, but I have less confidence. You know, I've, it's a slightly lower conviction call. So I mean, I think you want to probably be buying financials, tech, industrials, consumer discretionary. I think that's what you want to be overweighting within your portfolio. All right, but which asked, financials? Like what what type of financials? I mean, I think banks look pretty good. I think capital markets companies look pretty good. I don't really know that anything looks terrible. Private equity firms look good. You've got a steepening yield curve. That means a wider net interest margin when banks make loans. You've got accelerating growth. That generally means lower risk loans and fewer defaults. It's a very good setup for bank stocks. Um, Re regionals. Yeah, lenders, right? So you could say the big money center banks do other stuff besides lending, but it's a very good setup for spread lenders. So, um, you know, whether or not they outperform money center banks, I have probably a little bit more conviction that spread lenders do very well, at least in absolute terms. But I'm not really bearish on anything. I would say, you know, even utilities and staples tend to have positive returns in economic regimes where growth and inflation are accelerating. They're just not as positive as riskier stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can see it line go down when you, uh, I mean, all time lows in utilities relative to S&Ps, all time lows in the S&P low volatility index relative to S&Ps, 23 year lows or something in staples relative to S&Ps. I mean, line go down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's ugly stuff. And, you know, Stan Druckenmiller famously said the best economist he knows is the inside of the stock market, you know, the relative performance dynamics of the different sector and factor risks. And I think clearly what the market is telling you is like, you know, things are improving. Things are getting better, not worse. Uh, talk to me about industrials. Yeah. I, I think that I think that they're a buy. <laughs> I think industrials are, you know, historically one of the uh, most cyclical exposures, have the closest correlation with the growth data. We expect the growth data to accelerate. We think there's a lot of pent up demand in housing and for goods, right? If interest rates, think about what the housing market was like with the mortgage rate at 8%. Imagine what it's like at six and a half percent. It's obviously a lot better. There's more demand with six and a half percent mortgage rates that increases demand for housing that increases goods for, uh, excuse me, increases demand for goods associated with housing. So I think durable goods, you know, uh, cars, washing machines, home appliances, stuff that's manufactured, stuff that industrial companies make, you know, there's a pretty straight line from mortgage rates and housing market into earnings for industrial companies. So, you know, earnings for industrial companies go up over the next year. Industrial stocks probably go up as well. How do you and there's a lot of good setups. I just say like the market, the market looks to be agreeing with that view. You're getting good risk reward opportunities. So I think you should probably take them. Um, before I get to the next question, where in industrials and in engineering, machinery? Um, I don't know that I have a view on the sub industry level, so to speak. There's um, so many. Yeah, there's, there's so many. It's such a diverse sector. I would say probably things that are closer, a little bit closer to manufacturing. Some of the stuff that's a little bit more idiosyncratic, some of the more, you know, professional services to me doesn't really mean all that much, even though it's included in industrials. I think that could be like almost anything. Um, so I would say stuff 
stuff that has a closer relationship to the manufacturing cycle is the stuff I have more confidence. I like transports. I like trucking specifically. Uh, I think like, look at the chart for old dominion freight. I think that's a, that's a William O'Neill, you know, classic cup and handle setup. It's a good uh, risk reward. The fundamentals are supportive. I think that's an opportunity that you probably want to be taking. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, that we we came up with over the last couple of days, uh, you know, because it was a it was basically a team meeting with some with some friends that tagged along. Um, we're building a Dow Transports X Airlines. <laughs> That's probably what you want to go along. <laughs> the, the airlines are doing one thing. Truckers and rails and, and are they doing something else. Right. Right. Well, the airlines are notoriously bad businesses. I feel like that's one of those sub industries where you could say, like, well, look, if if airlines are doing well, that's like a buy everything signal. Like China. If China's doing well, how bad could things be? Right. Well, I don't know. I think that might be that might have been a good indicator for the last 20 years. I'm I'm not particularly bullish on the fundamental story in China. Um, Hey, you know what? You got a lot of company. There, Mike. uh, Yeah, well, that that, you know, that makes me (laughs) that makes me uncomfortable. I know. I know. But um, and it's easy to it's, you know, cyclically, like, of course, China's probably going to have more upswings over the next 10 or 20 years. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to get long. I just think China's best days economically are behind it. And therefore, the best days for its financial markets are probably behind it as well. Um, Mike, last time we were on, you're on uh, all the way back in May. It's been a while. Um, you, were talking about rude, sem- you were talking about semis. Right, right. right. Well, we were we were more bearish on the economic outlook. Yes. Back, yes. back in May. Right. And at the time you were like, well, what do you like? And we're like home builders, semiconductors. And you're like, well, I think Steve was like, well, that doesn't sound like a recession playbook. And I think that it's important to, to make a distinction between uh, your fundamental bottom up economic outlook and what the market is telling you. Um, and even though we were bearish on the economy, the charts for home builders and the charts for semiconductors obviously looked very good. And those have obviously been two very high performing sectors. So I think, you know, even as a macro person, you have to respect what the market is telling you or you're you know, going to get your clock clean. And I think when your fundamental outlook and the market are confirming each other and you're seeing the ball clearly, that's when you want to take more incremental risk. You know, obviously I was caught a little bit off guard by the Fed meeting in December and the market had gotten way ahead of that, more ahead of it than I've seen at any point in the data. But I think it, you know, it goes to show you, you have to listen to the market. You have to have respect for the market, you know, no matter how good a macro analyst you think you are. What do you think about this? Um, you know, over the last couple of years, a lot of growth value, especially with with bonds doing what they're doing. You know, those correlations really spiked. What about this year? The thought that, you know, focusing too much on the growth versus value might be a little distracting. Um, versus maybe focusing more on a high beta versus low volatility. Yeah, I'm I'm 100 percent on board with you on that one. I think that you know you get the growth value question all the time. And I think this is an environment where you really just want to be buying both. (laughs) You know, my expectation is that, you know, growth cyclicals outperform, value cyclicals outperform. You know, if you were to run a back test, at least according to our back test, typically value tends to perform a little bit better in this environment. But do you really want to be making uh, an active decision to underweight tech, you know, given its performance? I think tech is clearly leadership. We're happy because if you're over- underweight tech for a lot of portfolio managers, if you're underweight tech, you're short. Right. And I just don't think that makes sense. Is this when you want to be underweight tech? You know, when growth is accelerating, the Fed is pivoting towards easing. It's historically still a very good environment toward, for tech. I think but how much be, of that is already priced in? Things don't get priced in as quickly as everyone says. Have you, you've seen the old meme that everything since the beginning of time was priced in. Your birth was priced into the standard oil stock price at 1915. Yeah. I think, I think people really spend funny. too much time. It's funny. Yeah. You don't think that's funny? I, it's I really like funny. It's really yeah. funny. And I think it's a good, I think it's a, it's making a good point, which is that people spend so much time worrying about what's priced in that they miss good opportunities. And I think when the risk reward presents itself and it's attractive, you just have to take, you have to take the risk and take the opportunity and not, uh, you know, get paralysis by analysis. A, yeah. a, uh, a fun, albeit dangerous uh, drinking game um, you could play if you just turn on, a certain financial news network during the day and you just drink every time a guest says priced in. Right. It always sounds smart to say stuff is priced in, but it's completely impossible to prove and it ends up causing you to make bad decisions. It's (laughs) not something I spend a ton of time thinking about unless we're talking about really, really backward looking data. I got Um, a question for you, Mike. When you take a look at the um, technology sector ETF, XLK, 
and you uh, you put that over the S&P 500. So attack versus S&P ratio going back 25 years. We're still not back at those 2,000 highs. But if you take the S&P index itself, S&P tech versus the S&P, we are above those levels. How do you so think about I don't know that? how much stock to put into those really long-term levels of resistance like that. The experience that I have is that support and resistance tend to be important. And a lot of times they're caused by behind the scenes activity with market makers in the options market. And most of the time you tend to see the most options activity, the most open interest at support and resistance from the last, I don't know, call it three years or so. Sometimes it's a little shorter term than that. So I, I tend to put more weight on short to shorter to intermediate term levels of support and resistance. So call it going back three years, maybe five years. I think 20 years is a little bit of a stretch. Um, I, I haven't seen just, this is more or less anecdotal, but I haven't seen as much confirmation from options activity, which I think tends to drive a lot of the supply and di demand dynamics, which create support and resistance. So that's, that's my two cents on that. So you think the fact that silver in, uh, in 2010, 2011 got back to those, uh, highs from when the hunt brothers cornered the market in the early eighties and immediately turned around and crashed. You think that's a coincidence? Uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to say that there's a, a fundamental reason for that to happen. That is an amazing coincidence. So maybe it's not, it's maybe probably it's not, a coincidence. not. It's probably not. Yeah. I mean, how long did it spend at that level? Were there really people holding it for, uh, 35 years waiting to get out at that exact price. It sounds incredible, but I mean, that it touched it and then went right back down. That's It is an amazing chart. I don't really uh, have a good response for that. Come on, Mike. God. How many people could really own it at that level? <laughs> I mean, it's a small market. It's actually smaller than the crypto markets. It might have been the Hunts Brothers still. <laughs> nice. It's their family members. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, silver is like 1.3 trillion and in in market cap and cryptos at 1.5 yeah i think i would probably take the long crypto long crypto short silver over the next 10 years but also over the next six months talk to me about crypto so how much work do you do on the crypto side yeah it's it's mostly top-down work I, I don't go into the different alts and look at the different protocols and their fundamentals and make calls that way but what i will say is i do know the different economic and macro regimes in which crypto tends to perform very well and in which higher risk forms of crypto tend to do very well. And look, when the Fed is easing or when monetary policy is at least stable and economic growth is accelerating, that tends to be when the really nice gains happen in crypto and when growth is declining and monetary conditions are deteriorating, that tends to be when you get the worst returns from crypto. Right now we're in a positive regime. I think you wanna be taking more risk portfolio wide. And I think that means that you probably want to be long crypto. You certainly don't want to be short crypto when economic conditions are supportive. I think history has told you that's a great way to, uh, you know, get stopped out quickly if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, you lose a bunch of money. Um, so I, mean, I think it short moves, term, it moves with the, it moves with the uh, equities markets. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, those, those same conditions apply to equity markets. That's true. Crypto is really just a higher beta version of that. I mean, if you looked at, I haven't looked at this chart in a little while, but um, Bitcoin and the ratio of high beta to low beta stocks used to have yes. like a 95% correlation. Yes. It used to be like one of the closest intermarket correlations. And I think that's illustrative, right? When you're buying crypto, you're taking a bunch of risk. There are markets where you're rewarded for taking a bunch of risk. Those are the markets where you want to get super long. And I, you know, I'm inclined to think that we're probably in one of those markets right now. Yeah, they're still, they're still moving pretty tightly. Uh, it's, it's pretty impressive, uh, except over the last couple of weeks. Hmm. Mike, over the last what, couple of weeks, Bitcoin's come off and, you know, high beta's outperformed. Mike, what would cause you to maybe uh, take your foot off the gas a little bit? So I think that there are, there are a lot of things. I think probably the biggest one is, you know, headed into 2024, we were seeing negative momentum in the labor market. You know, you could look at yeah. job openings, you could look at wage growth, you could look at hours worked. The Kansas City Fed has a really great index called the Labor Market Conditions Index. It takes mm -hmm. about 25 different labor market indicators. But the reason that we care and the reason that momentum matters in the labor market is that as with financial markets, momentum tends to persist in the labor market. So when conditions are deteriorating, they tend to keep getting worse. So obviously, when you see momentum breaking negative in the labor market, you know, after the yield curve has been inverted for 12 or 13 months, you know, when you're getting a bunch of other recessionary signals, that's a big red light in your process. And so I think that if 
the negative momentum that we've seen in the labor market continues to persist, that would be evidence that we're going to be in a recession. The big question now, I think, is will the big easing of financial conditions that we've seen since October be enough to throw the labor market back into acceleration or at least cause it to stabilize? And right now, I think the best evidence we have, the highest frequency measures of data that we have, suggest, yes, it probably will be enough to stabilize the labor market and uh, you know, cause the U.S. economy to reaccelerate over at least the next six or nine months. And then from, you know, we'll take it from there. I don't know, maybe not like a glaring red signal, but like a flashing yellow, right? Like a right, maybe right. I mean, and look, it is, it is concerning. I would even go so far as to say recession risk is probably elevated relative to any given year. I think it's gone down considerably since October, um, yeah. but it's still maybe higher than average. And look, if you are well, really convinced that there is going to be a recession, volatility is really, you know, really cheap. Options, Sean, <laughs> could probably construct a pretty good hedge if you're super concerned about um, portfolio risk right now or major drawdown risk. So there is an option for you if you're still worried about a recession. But I think I would probably be trying to figure out ways of taking more risk rather than taking less risk right now. That's that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Mike, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is a big theme that's going unnoticed right now that you are focused on that you don't think anybody else is? You know, getting back to sentiment, right? Um, contrary to popular belief, it's not these fundamentals that are driving prices; it's positioning, right? Where Where do you think our people are mispositioned? Yeah, I mean, I think that the answer is that they're generally not bullish enough. Um, I think that this this isn't a positioning data point, but something that I think is getting completely, I'll give you two things that I think are getting completely ignored. One, we've seen a two or three decline, excuse me, a two or three sigma decline in interest rates over the last three months. That's a really big deal, right? That affects economic behavior. It affects financial market performance. Um, when you see a two sigma decline in the 10-year real rate, I'm just picking one, and that's what we've seen over the last three months, forward returns for the S&P 500 tend to be 6.1% on average versus 1.9% for any given period going back to 1998. Um, that's a T-stat of 6.8. Anything over two is considered statistically significant. So that's a very, very bullish indicator. That type of rapid easing in financial conditions, you know, historically causes growth to reaccelerate. It's meaningful. The second thing I'll add is another, um, you know, anti-recession data point. The federal government is running a budget deficit at nearly 7% of GDP. That's an acceleration of 80 basis points relative to last year. So government spending is going to be more impactful in 2024, not less impactful. And how does that affect the economy? Why should we care? Well, if you look at the numbers, the way that deficits tend to impact the economic data, it tends to mean uh, a lower unemployment rate, faster consumption growth, faster inflation, and higher rates. Those are all reflationary slash inflationary influences. And within the context of an economy that's still growing uh, in, a, in accelerating terms and real growth and a central bank that's more or less easing or allowing monetary conditions to sort of stabilize, faster inflation isn't necessarily a bad thing for financial markets. So I think that folks are ignoring a rather potent mix of stimulus from the Fed and interest rates and the federal government. Okay. What, what, what do you make of all these money markets? Oh, man. I, look, I, I think that if why I, are you why are you rolling your eyes? I'm not rolling my eyes. I think no, not I, you, I'm, Spencer. I am. I am. Why are you rolling your eyes? How, how sticky or not sticky is this? Is this money, Mike? Forget the stickiness. I want to know what Mike thinks about. Forget the retail people and their you know checking accounts and grandma institutional money pushing four trillion. What what do you make of that? So I think that. Uh, that's mostly people chasing yield, unsurprisingly. Um, so it's not, I don't think that it's money that's necessarily on the same, it's not necessarily cash on the sidelines for the stock market. Um, that said, I think that there is a pretty good chance that the Fed's going to cut this year. They're literally telling you they're going to cut by 75 basis points. So if you believe that the reason money has flowed into money markets is higher short-term interest rates, then it's reasonable to expect that lower short-term interest rates will cause a rebalancing effect economy-wide economy wide or financial markets wide and send money into high risk assets. I think a lot of times that'll be sort of shorter term, you know, uh, credit risk instruments, like maybe uh, some sort of commercial paper or something like that. But on the margin, it probably will put more money into equities and, and probably but, is. But do you think do you market. think a lot of that is 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 fixed income money that's just being put into that bucket as opposed to maybe a bond or something else? 
and that's not potentially equity allocation? I think it's equity allocation on the margins. You know, maybe like 5% of it is equity allocation. So nothing. So you don't think that money's ever going to go to stocks? No, 5% is a big deal. I'll draw an analogy with another 5% market. 5% of 4 trillion is a big deal, is it? Yeah, because supply supply is kind of inelastic for stocks. You know, what you're not going to sell your stocks. What is it, 20 on... billion? Somebody want to do the math? 200 billion? What's the number? Yeah, right. Here, I'll give you an analogy in the oil market because we have really good data on it. Yeah, 200 really billion dollars. Data. That's nothing. Well, there's really good data on supply and demand in the oil market. And what it'll show you if you look at it is very small increases in demand have a huge impact on the spot price of oil because supply can't react that quickly. Right. And I think it's the same thing with if you have a vertical supply curve, right, and demand just increases a little, it causes a big increase in price. And I think that when you have an economic environment that's conducive to risk taking, you're not selling your stocks. I'm not selling my stocks. I, I might actually be buying even more stocks if interest rates decline. Right. So the vertical, the, the supply curve is very, very vertical. And then you've got demand going up quickly. Even if it's only 5% of money market assets, I think it actually does have a meaningful impact on stocks. Yeah. Less than $200 billion. Yeah, two hundred billion dollars sounds a little small. Five percent of four trillion. It's not even four trillion. It's like three point seven, three point eight. So five percent of that, you're looking at one hundred and seventy billion, something like that. Doesn't seem like a lot. It does seem small. I'd have to probably do the math myself. But in general, I think the principle is true that you're looking at what a forty-five trillion dollar market in the equities in U.S. equities, seventy something globally. Well, I think that it's important to appreciate that it's not. You're not adding one hundred and seventy billion to five trillion. You know, and then dividing by five trillion to get like one point, you know, it doesn't translate to like two percent more price appreciation. It's you know, it's a question of supply and demand. Um, but I don't know, it's not a primary driver of of my bullishness on stocks, but it, it's just to say but I think but it's not, but it's but it's not a negative. No, it's not a it's I think it's a net positive, even if it's a small one. That's that's probably fair. Right. It's a net positive, just how positive is it? Uh you probably should look for other positive things. Right. I, th I think we can all agree on that. All right. All right. All right. I'm good. I'm good with that answer. You're Mike good. Mike Singleton, Invictus Research. Uh, guys, you, great follow. Check him out. Link to his site is uh, down below in the description, as is his Twitter. Mike, it is always a pleasure. Uh, so last time we had you on, um, you were a little bit more bearish. This time a little more bullish. Next time, who knows? He, he was well, bearish, but he was buying the most bullish stocks. Yeah, so he, he was, was right. buying semis. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Straz afterwards, he's like, Hold on, he's bearish, but he's buying semis and home builders. Well, hey, that 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 worked whatever, out. Whatever it worked, that worked out. That, that worked, worked out. out. <laughs> nice Thanks job, lot, Mike. Mike. Nice job. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, all right. Uh, let's just talk Tesla for a That's quick second. That's like being like, here. oh, I'm going to um, be a vegetarian. I'm going to start by eating a ribeye tonight. It's like, all right, well. <laughs> uh, let, let's just talk Tesla. Um, the, the earnings, the earnings wasn't great, as we said. The stock is down this morning. Uh, I wanted to bring up this tweet from uh, Economic, who is definitely one of my favorite follows uh, on Twitter. Um, and this is just an amazing point to make. Elon tweeted November sixth, twenty twenty one. Should I sell ten percent of my Tesla, or do you support me selling ten percent of my Tesla stock? And wouldn't you know it, that was the top. That was the all-time high right there. November 21. I just find these things to be so, so amazing. Um, and I thought it was a great, great call out from Jake here. So. I mean, listen, we, we talked about it the other day. Uh, I was talking about it with Howard Lindzen. You know, never have we seen this much market capitalization Uh it so fast increased right hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars just created overnight practically yeah you know you need some digestion of that like we've never seen anything like that so the fact that tesla's kind of been in a messy range for a few years honestly well deserved well deserved no like i mean for example we hit it hard the last few nights you know monday night party bus beers, champagne, pizza. It was very aggressive. We, we hadn't even started the analysis yet. We were already getting wild. Tuesday night, wild. 35, 40 people. I don't know how many bottles of wine we had. It was a lot. It was very aggressive. Uh, did yeah, you get the total? It was probably like 15 bottles. No, I did not. Uh, it was probably at least 15, maybe more. Uh, it's probably closer to 20. And then last night, I had a couple of Negronings before, uh, before heading back. Uh, so tonight... 
I'm just going to chill. Well deserved, right? I earned chilling out tonight after <laughs> such aggressive behavior over the last few days. Tesla's just like that. Tesla's oh, just like that. I was that. wondering where, where you're going with that. <laughs> Tesla's just like that. The stock All went right. from 11 to 390. Uh huh. Uh huh. Or actually, it was like 150 to 1,000. But and then and then they split. But uh, yeah, same idea. But yes, uh, I'm trying to get the market capitalization uh, increase here um, because it was just on a whole nother level. So yeah, I mean, by that same logic, I think did someone in the chat just say this? Maybe maybe they did. Um, uh, yeah, Judd, right? By that same logic, NVIDIA, or, or even AMD, right? Uh, same, you're saying has increased market capitalization? Same type of uh, parabolic market cap increase, yeah. So just to put things in perspective, in at the COVID lows, Tesla had a market cap. Oh, this isn't right. Yeah, I, I, I'll get it. Give me like 30 seconds. Why is it my not... Uh... I have to like re-log into all my things because I've been gone for a few days. Why is it saying 207? I'm not getting, for some reason, I'm not getting the right data here. Uh, I yeah, get I'm, not get, I'm not getting the right data. I'm just getting the, I'm all getting right. the prices. Ba, 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 ba. All right, COVID low. Yeah, what was the market test cap? The, test the market cap. 93 no 79 billion dollars and then it got to what one point what it got to 1.2 1 1.2 1 and what was the what was the covid low what did i say 79 79 you so know 79 billion to 1.2 trillion in how in, in what in how long two years from from march of 22 to january sorry march of 20 to january 22 so almost two years and it increased market capitalization by a trillion. Uh, just about. All right. So a trillion dollars in less than two years. And NVIDIA did not do that. Uh, did it? No. No. No, no it's no. not. So never, ever in history. By the way, NVIDIA is now 1.5 trillion. Uh, never in history have we seen that much market capitalization added that quickly. Um, NVIDIA at the lows last uh at the october 22 lows was 109 this thing's up five times so it's increased by uh, you know what though yeah going off the same covid low nvidia we'll call it 150 150 billion to 1.5 trillion fact factor of 10 so nvidia created more market capitalization in that period than tesla uh, from 150 to one, and the, 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 well, the difference, of course, is Tesla's not at its high as Nvidia is, but uh, Tesla's not Nvidia what from one from 150 to 1.5 where they're at oh, right now. Tesla didn't add what? Well, Tesla's not at Tesla is not no longer at those highs, right? But at the highs, right, right, right. 70, what did I say, 79 to 1.2. Um, and then this one was 150 to 1.5. Yeah. It's 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 in the neighborhood. It's in the ballpark. That's serious market cap, man. Just like a trillion yeah. here, a trillion there. No big I deal. I know here. Let, Are you noticing how we're throwing, a, we're, we're throwing much, out but... these? Uh, we're throwing out a trillion like so often. It's like oh, Apple three trillion, Microsoft three trillion, Nvidia added a trillion, Tesla added a trillion, Meta just uh, got to a trillion. Do I have that I right? Wanna, I, I want to look at AMD, and I know it's much smaller scale, but I want to look anyway. So, um, so AMD... many trillion. In that same span, AMD uh, fifty one to two ninety. All right, not nearly as not as big as I thought. Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there is the re there is there is a reason that we we whoever somebody came up with the magnificent seven because these seven stocks were so far ahead of the pack in terms of market cap, right? Um, and uh, Jerry Carey asking a great question. First individual trillionaire, Elon. Um, I, I mean, where's he at Elon now? What's his net worth now? I, within the by the end, of, how about this? By the end of the decade, for sure. Elon's at two hundred and twenty billion. End Bezos is at one seventy eight. Um, the French guy from LVMH, he's at uh, one eighty. 
Oh, Bill Gates is down to 120. Uh, Bernard Arnault. Yeah. yeah. And where's Wait, uh, where's Uncle how, Warren? How, remember when LVMH like couldn't stop going down or couldn't stop going up? Let's yeah. see. How was that, that doing? That's when it stopped going up. Yeah. Warren Buffett is is basically broke in comparison with only 123 <laughs> billion. Wow. LVMH got to a thousand dollars. LVMH. Wow. Whew. So so the bet is Elon Musk gets to a trillion first. He's got He's got to uh, go four x from current levels. I don't know. I I, I mean, pro- like he would have to. There would have to be some some sort of exits. Well, do you IPOs. take do you take Elon, Bill, Uncle Warren, Bezos, no. or the field? Oh, wait, Elon, Bill Gates, Uncle uh, Warren, Bezos, Warren, and the French guy, or the field? Not you. You don't want to put Tim Cook in that group? No. What's Tim Cook's net worth? I don't know. No. Um. Uh. Yeah, I would probably take that group. I mean, Tim I wouldn't Cook's take worth Warren, two billion, I wouldn't take bro. Warren Buffett at all. Tim but... Cook is like a homeless man in comparison. Yeah, all right. I wouldn't take Warren Buffett at all. <laughs> no, but I would take uh, Elon, uh, Bill Gates, or, or or Bezos. So you'll say Elon over the field? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe. Well, again, it would just it, it all depends on his other companies, right? Uh, Starlink and uh, and uh, what, uh, what the hell is it called? Um, uh, space, uh, SpaceX, right? Victor, I love you, but when I get to 100 million, you're never going to see me again. So, Starlink and SpaceX, right? If they have some kind of liquidity event, some kind of IPO, whatever, then yeah, yes, it he will get there. Cool, it's just a question of if they do that. So, don't know. Uh, all right, uh, 934. What else was on my oh, yeah, I had a couple other things I wanted to, I wanted to, and, and actually, and we got a good email for recess. A great question from you for recess, for you for recess. So we'll save that for uh, for later. Uh, we got an email though I thought was interesting, um, and I, I don't I don't know if you have a strong opinion on this, but I do. It's from Alex, and he goes, it's talking about index investing. And he goes, uh, JC mentioned, and and this is a while ago that you said this, but that you double your S and P five hundred contribution when the index falls 8% or more. Um, and he, uh, Alex was looking at the chart report from yesterday and saw that a couple of tweets uh, that suggested uh, that you know the trend is your friend, essentially buy high, sell higher. Uh, and then, of course, there's Jeff Hirsch, who's talking about seasonality and said the best time to buy is uh, November to April. Um, so he's trying to understand, basically, when is the best time to buy the indexes? It's a great question. Um, so and... it, it depends on the strategy is the answer, right? So all these statistics of you're better off buying high and selling higher versus buying low and selling high, that's like over a one-year time frame, right? Six, year, year and a half, right? And and that makes sense. We always say it all the time. Like you, buying low and selling high is, is a lie. That's not how markets work. You want to buy high, yep. sell higher, right? That's how markets work, uh, generally speaking. Um, what I'm talking about is a completely different strategy. These are my kids' college funds. These are, are my family. Uh, my wife and I are like our retirement stuff, things mm-hmm. we're not going to touch for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. So if you're adding every month to the S&P, you're buying at the highs, you're buying at the lows, and you're buying everywhere in the middle. And if you've ever seen a chart of compound interest, you see that curve really whip at the end. And if you if you double the position when the S&P is down 8% or 10% or whatever it is you decide for yourself in a given month or a quarter, however you do it, all you're going to do is that tail at the end is going to whip that much harder. Like you're adding like Nas to your, you know, to your acceleration. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> the old like, nitrous oxide. A little yeah. nitrous oxide is what you're doing with that. Like you might not see that much of an impact in the short term. Like you might yes. not even notice it. But when you see the tail at the end, holy shit. Yeah, you, your short-term timing might be horrible, but, um, but yes. that's okay. The, the glib answer to this question, what I always say, is the best time to buy the indexes for a long-term account, retirement account. The best time to buy it was yesterday. The second best time to buy is today, right? Um, so that that's sort of how I approach it. Uh, again, when it comes to the long-term stuff, if if it, if it's automated, that's probably easier. You don't have to think about it, um, and you just go whatever set set them out every month. Yeah, it depends. Every it, year, depends on, it depends on what you're trying to do. 
right? Yes. I would never do any of that stuff for most strategies that I do, but for retirement yes. stuff and the kids' college fund where I'm just adding every month. Yep. Yes, that's that's how you do it. Yeah. The, it's totally the, uh... different than what you know, and, and we do a lot of stuff here and we talk about a lot of stuff and the crypto and the options and trading this and buying that. This is something completely different that anybody can do. A lot of people do contribute every month. That's a very popular thing to do. Yep. For good reason. Right. Uh, but what I would, you know, it's a, it, it's the greatest momentum strategy of all time. You're buying more of the best ones, less or none of the worst ones. Like it's, it's hard to uh, get a better momentum strategy. And for that particular sleeve, uh, double up uh, when S and P's fall eight percent. Yeah, yeah. That's of what course. I'm doing. Um, you know, the, the, the and the problem with waiting for an eight percent drop is you could wait pff, years, years. So, all right, yeah, it doesn't happen often. Yeah, uh, but when right, it does, uh, if you have that particular type of strategy in your yeah, sure, you know, arsenal, sure. All right. Uh, do Do you want to whip up a Tesla chart real fast so we can actually uh, look at it? Because um, you know, um, like I said, tough report. Uh, they they missed on the top and the bottom line. Talked a lot about how uh, demand is strong, but people can't afford their cars, and um, allegedly demand is strong for their trucks, but they can't make them fast enough. So, um, you know, um, the last few calls he's been railing against interest rates. So, uh, as sort of the the devil here um and the reason that people can't afford their cars which there's probably some truth to that in any case uh like i said top and bottom line missed um operating margin down and five, uh, five. the the rate of the rate of deliveries i believe fell as well so let, let's let's pull up a, a chart here of of the old uh the old tesla and see what's uh see let's see what's doing what do we got um, well, we're in this range, and our bet was that it was going to remain in this range. We're down at that lower end of 190. If we close below 190, we're going to unwind that position. Uh, I'm going to talk to Sean. I don't think it'll be too bad because, remember, we yeah. have the condor, so we're hedged on both sides. We bought the wings, so we're, we're long the 180 puts. Uh, but now that the event is over and volatility contracts, see how we close uh, on the day. As long as we're above 190, we'll be fine. Uh, right now, uh, we are at 189 and a half. So see how we close. We're right there. Yep. There's right. a lot of support there. That's why we chose that strike, by the way. Right? There's a reason yeah. why we sold the 190 puts. And the market is reiterating uh, that, yes, in fact, that is an important level. All right. Um, gosh. JC, would you short AMD? Uh, no. <laughs> why would I short AMD? I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were telling me how they were dying to short Nvidia. Who was it that I was talking to? Who the hell was I talking to? Di who said it? I was who was that? Who I was, wasn't I'm trying that. to think who was it that I was telling me that they'd been dying to short Nvidia and I'm like, "Why?" I don't recall hearing that. Who was I talking to? I'm losing my let mind. If, let, let it be known we were on on Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, we were we were looking for a trade to put on and it was sort of a just Shout out your trade ideas. And I did say I like Netflix here. Um, of course, I didn't put the trade out in time, but uh, they, they they blew it away. And you know what? They're holding on to those gains, which you love to see, right? It's not so much the reaction. It's the reaction to the reaction. That's right. And what about uh, we talked about putting on a long position in uh, a TSM when it broke above 110. That one's acting very well too. TSM. Oh, wow. Look at TSM there. N nice gap up. And, and I then want some. semi. Ooh. New all-time highs, dude. How about this? When we said, um, when we said, uh, all right, you know, what are your favorite trades? You know, we we kind of had that little segment, and I threw out Berkshire Hathaway. The grunts and moans that I heard yeah. in that room when yeah. I heard Berkshire, when I threw out Berkshire Hathaway. Why do you think that yeah. group? And by the way, a lot of that group was our own team. Why do you think that there was grunts and and moans I, when I said um, that? Um, I think. I don't know where the grunts came from. I maybe me. I don't know. Um, maybe <laughs> Probably you, you. Maybe because you've said that before. I feel like uh, it just broke out to new all-time highs. A new trade. What do you mean? Yeah. All right. Um, probably because it's like it's like the most obvious thing that you could say, right? It's like Berkshire Hathaway. All right. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
um not 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 exotic enough <laughs> i mean uh, think about it what's in it not, financials not industrials sexy, berkshire hathaway you know what's sexy it, it makes yeah it makes money industrials tech yeah. insurance hello did you not hear the conversation with mike singleton right right well yeah yeah he didn't say um, it but he might as well have said just buy berkshire because it's like you know yeah, tech, yeah, yeah. insurance said that could have said that, could have said that. Could have said that. Uh, uh, on the conversation of semis yeah we should mention the dutch master asml um ripping today right um, i love that you call it that well no i got that from you no i know <laughs> uh asml yeah blew it away top and bottom line beat uh did they did they gave uh good strong guidance uh guidance uh, for for next year similar to or guidance for this year similar to last year so uh which which was good uh interim an interim dividend what they they're going to uh they announced an interim dividend of $1 uh 1 euro 45 1.45 euros, I guess, per share. Um, so a 5% dividend increase. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, I got a chart for you. Uh, I'm trying to look at what's... Uh, oh, IBM up 10%? Oh, oh you look. took the... I was literally... That's the chart I was putting up. Did, was it? IBM up 10%. Uh, let's see. EPS beat. Sales beat. Uh, what do they Light say sticks. about guidance? Light um sticks. Client demand for AI is accelerating. Really? Huh? Didn't, didn't know. All right. What do you got here? IBM? Yeah. Talk about not sexy. What's not sexy about it? Uh, it's international business machines. Maybe sexy in the 70s. Um, sexy in the 90s. Yeah, 90s too. Yeah, this thing went from 50s. 10 to 135. Uh, 13 bagger and then uh peaked in 13 and has been consolidating nicely and literally as we speak it's making new 10-year highs are you not entertained no i mean i i am and it, that's interesting right it's i don't um, know you're it, the one it, that said it's boring it, uh well it's just because it is it's a slow and stodgy stock i mean just look at the last uh By slow and stodgy up 10 percent today that's what that's why I said, whoa, up 10%. <laughs> because... By the way, $175 billion in market cap. Yeah. 10% is like eye popping for this stock. That's why that's what jumped out to me. So I'm just, just look at the range in the last few years, 110 to 170 right now. It's, you know, that's for tech. That's stodgy. Yeah. So uh, anyway, the, I'm not saying the chart looks bad. It certainly doesn't. Um, just a just a boring stock in general. That's all. But I, yeah. you know, look at me talking about I, uh, IBM, Berkshire Hathaway. Am I the old man in the room now? Yeah, yeah, you are. You are. I am. Um, I'm okay with that. By the way. Uh, I'm okay with that. All right. Wait. We 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 have Sean here. Uh, Sean. Uh, Sean back from his travels. Um, back from New York, where where we were. We were all in the same place. So. <laughs> Let's talk about this options trade you guys put on and uh, yeah, whatever else is on his mind. Shawnee. What's up, fellas? Uh, hey. What is going on back there? What do you got? What do you oh, yeah. Think? We got a little, little construction project going on here in my house. My, uh, my wife's a nice. photographer. This is a white screen that she uses and she needs to stretch it out and I don't know. She needs to do it there. So it's there. <laughs> Photography stuff. Uh, so what'd you think? What'd you think of the, uh, the last few days? Good times. Fantastic event, man. Uh, our, our clients who came out, uh, were super engaged, super fun, um, full of great ideas and just, uh, just really great to put, uh, faces to, yeah. to the email addresses that I'm usually engaging with. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah. what about, uh, you know, I think exceeded expectations oh, easily. 100%. 100%. I texted my boy at the hotel and I was like, dude, that was awesome. Like, I mean, just the service was amazing. The food. How about the food Tuesday night was awesome. 
My wife uh, saw the pictures that Mary had shared in our in our uh, Slack channel. She's like, wow, that place was beautiful. Like, really nice looking space. I was like, yeah, it was. It was. I mean, it's a brand new hotel. Yeah, we, yeah the, the, the room we were in was um, was very nice. Uh, in the chat, Sean, T-Man says, thanks for key. That paid for my membership. That's the idea. Well, I'm glad it paid for your membership because it didn't pay for mine. I got stopped out for a loss. He held through it. Well, good, good on you, buddy. Yeah, I got stopped at the Wells Fargo, so similar situation. I also got stopped in Wells Fargo. But hey, in- uh, you guys were talking Tesla earlier. Um, I wanted to update you guys. Yeah, please. So we have an iron condor trade on in that. And, and JC, you were saying uh, I wanted to just correct you at least. I mean, you're, you're doing what you do with your money. But what I'm doing with that trade is my stop is below 187. You were talking 190. Um, 187. You want, you want to let stop. it dance a little? You want to let it? Why 187 out of curiosity? Uh, because that was uh, the, the break even levels. When you, when you factor in the credit that we received for the trade, we, we collected three bucks to get in. So the actual we break the even total. at expiration is 187. So, so under that's normal the level circumstances, I'm... that 190 put that was short, that would traditionally be the stop, which is why I've been focused on that for the day. But because the break even is three points lower, just only a percent and a half, you're saying let her dance a little more. Yeah. And hey, the good news is that you were asking like where we're at. We we sold this spread for about three and change, like 310 is what I got for it. Right now, if I were to close it right now, it's going to cost me 430. So we're, we're not sitting on a big loss here. Very, very manageable loss, all things considered. I mean, the stock's down 19 points and we're only down a buck. Hey, that's great. Not uh, too shabby. Well, that's because that. volatility just. Well, exactly, exactly. And if Tesla holds here, and even trades up a little bit, uh, even just a buck or two over the next day or so, uh, I have a really good feeling that we'll get out of this spread at our profit target before the end of the week. Or so if it just tomorrow. chills here, bounces a couple of points over the next few days, that volatility is going to get destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, that that's exactly the way we did it, right? We, we did this with defined risks so that if we had an event like we have right now, you know, it wouldn't be a white knuckler. We'll be like, all right, you know, loss is a loss. It's fine, but. What was the spread trade? What was the the whole condor trading for yesterday? Pre pre number, did you see? It was trading at about three. When I looked right before I left, which is right before the close, uh, it was trading about three seventy five, three eighty. So it's barely put it on. If you put it on right before the close yesterday, you're only down like fifty cents right now. So yeah, wow, yeah, fascinating. It's great. All right, one for the good guys. We'll take it. Um, Speaking of what about what about the ideas? What's that? Speaking of one for the good guys, can we talk about IBM for a second? Are you have you yeah. seen that chart? We were just talking about it. Holy right. cow! I mean, up. look, I, I'm cow. bullish. And we're long calls in this thing, and uh, we we were optimistic that this thing would go higher. But wow, this is exceeding expectations. Yeah, this thing is an absolute beast. Yep. Woo! One I, that's is, definitely is one for the good finally, guys. It, is Watson here? Is Watson finally taking over, making money? Who's Watson? <laughs> the Watson AI we've been hearing about for years. Who's Watson? Yeah, who's Watson? Watson is IBM's AI um, thing. I thought that, he just plays chess. On Jeopardy? Oh, yeah, the, the robot that plays chess, right? Ago? Yeah, and he kicks ass in Jeopardy. Does it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like 15 years ago. All right, well... Mark is starting to price that in now, I guess. They weren't wrong just early, just early. Right, right. Which we like to consider wrong, right, Shawnee? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> what what stood out from some of the ideas? You know, we, we, we played our favorite game. I'm glad Tyler Wood was there. Tyler's like, oh, you want me to stick around for a few minutes? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, I got to go to Bloomberg. I was like, nah, nah, you don't. Fuck them. <laughs> so he hung out for a little bit. And he's like, uh, and I was like, oh, this is my favorite thing we do. And he's like, really? So he's like, all right, let me get a coffee. So he sat there for the, you know, the, the, the debates that we have with, all right, let's buy this stock. Let's look at the options chain. Let's see what we could do. I really liked that a lot. Anything stood out over the last couple of days? Well, what, what I found most interesting. A lot of trades. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We had, uh, one of our, uh, attendees, uh, proposed a bearish earnings trade on Tesla. So speaking of Tesla, right? And we spent a lot of time talking through this. What's that? We spent a lot of time talking through this trade. Yeah. And look, I mean, 
he's off to a good start. He's not where he needs Tesla to be for that what trade. Did he buy? That what did he buy? Do you remember? So we were we we got a little exotic, right? We did we did something that we that we at least I don't do very often, but we looked at a bearish ratio spread trade in Tesla. And so let me uh, let me just pull it up the trade here so we could talk through some actual things. So we were looking at the February 9th expiration, which is uh, actually no, we were looking at the February two expiration. And he was of the mind that Tesla was going to have bad earnings and it was going to do what it does on earnings day and just continue falling from there. That was his one. That was his thesis. You said for target. What's that? His target was 150. He, yeah, he was saying 150 and he, and he thought he could get there over the next four or five trading days. If everything goes according to plan, which right now, I mean, he's off to a great start. Yeah. The trade that we talked about putting on was a, a bearish ratio spread put spread where we were going to sell a 210 put, which at the time yesterday was at the money, and buy uh, two 190 puts right. um, for, uh, you know, for to, to define the risk, but then also give him the potential for unlimited upside on a breakdown. And you know what? Right now, he's not looking too good. Because as, I, as I'm putting the trade together right now, when we were looking at that trade yesterday, right before the close, I believe that that credit that you could have got for that trade was uh, somewhere in the, the $3 range, the net credit, right? Buying the one, buying the 210 put, or I'm sorry, selling the 210 put and buying the buying two of the 190 puts. You could have done it for a small credit, not a small credit, but like a $2 and change credit. Well, right now, if I were to close this spread right now, it's going to cost me over nine bucks to close it. So he's sitting on a loser right now. And why? Why is that happening? Because oh, the short puts went way into the money. And so there's no premium left in those. But the 190 puts are th that are now at the money are starting to rapidly lose premium and not helping them out. Now, if this thing does follow through down to the downside and go to that 160, 155 target he was talking about this trade will play out very well um but he needs a, he's got a lot Wait, of work to how do. far out did how far out did did, did we go did you we were talking there? about the february 2nd weekly option so uh so expiring next friday so eight days from now okay hmm. yeah um all right. Yeah, I mean, it's not nope. a trade that we put on. We just we just discussed it as a group, yeah. and we went through how it would work, how it would not work. And right now, I mean, he's kind of sitting at his, unfortunately, his worst case scenario. Right, like the worst place that this stock could sit and just hang out is right here at 190. If it stays here at 190, this trade will suffer its maximum loss. That's no bueno. So. We needed a big move. I mean, he still might get it, right? His thesis was it's not going to happen right on following earnings, but it'll happen post earnings. It'll be like a drift. It'll be four or five days of just follow through all the way down. So we'll see. We'll, we'll check back next week and see how it played out. Yep. Yeah, it's only been uh, 26 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let it dance, as JC says. Let it dance. Yeah, right. Let her dance. Hit the bumper, Spencer. We got some recess. Alrighty then. Uh, I just want to say that um, I hadn't been to Dumbo in. I hadn't been to Dumbo in like probably like eight, nine years. I hadn't been to Dumbo in a long time. All right, for the West Coasters, what, can what you explain Dumbo to them important? what Dumbo is? So Dumbo is a little section of Brooklyn uh, that's in between the Manhattan Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge, right? Because the Manhattan Bridge and the and the Brooklyn Bridge like converge in Brooklyn. There's like it's this little space under, in between. The, down under Manhattan, Brooklyn overpass. overpass. Down oh. under Manhattan okay. and Brooklyn overpass. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, there's a pizza place, Grimaldi's, which is not where it used to be. I was like, Rachel, it's over here. She's like, no, 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 JC, it's over here now. And I'm like, really? Am I losing my mind? Right? So they moved it around the corner. It was very confusing. Um, I love how uh, there were Russians at Grimaldi's, uh, Puerto Ricans at, uh, at Lombardi's, um, you know, Middle Eastern guy at uh, Prince Street Pizza, like, 
Do Italian people don't work at pizza joints anymore? <laughs> Do you notice? We went to all these pizza places on a single Italian in sight. No, there were Italians um, at uh, where, at the Little Italy spot, right? Where were we at? Uh, at Middle Grimaldi, Eastern. I think it was, it, it was Grimaldi's when uh, for our order, right? Because JC put the order in, so so the name was under Juan. Juan, <laughs> and they spelled it right. Was it H U A N? H U A N. That's right. That was good. That was good. He so brought anyway, the pizza up. Was, and he's like, he he showed me the name. He's like, this is for this guy. I'm like, no, that's not us. I, I figured that was like some Chinese guy. I'm like, no, that's not us. <laughs> He's like, no, no, it's you guys. I'm like, no, oh, and then finally I figured it, it out. Like, oh, oh, I, I just see what he's say, doing. I just want to say that the uh, the the views of the Brooklyn Bridge from Dumbo uh, really are spectacular. Really, really are. I hadn't been there in quite some time. I used to go there all the time because I would ride my bike over the Brooklyn Bridge, get pizza, go to the Brooklyn Creamery, kind of hang out at that park a little bit, and then take the water taxi back over. So you don't have to ride your bike over the bridge again after eating all that pizza and ice cream, you know? Put it on the water taxi, three bucks takes you across. That's that was my move back in the day. Uh, and I hadn't been there in quite some time. But at night, I couldn't tell you the last time I was in Dumbo at night. I mean, whoo, forever ago. Uh it, it was lovely, was it not? It was, lovely. It, it was lovely. A little chilly, but lovely. Not too bad though. Not bad. No. Yeah. No, it wasn't too bad. Um, all right. Well, oh, before I forget, we got a question. Uh, an email from Feza. He goes, I'm a regular morning show watcher. Who's in Miami for 10 days. I'm hoping for JC's recommendation on a casual Cuban restaurant. I've been to Versailles many times and I'm looking for something different. Go to La Carreta. Yeah, go to La Carreta. It's fine. Wait, wait, can you can you like spell that? La L A Carreta C A R R E T A. La Carreta. Good spot. Okay. I like it. Um, you can also go, if you want to get a frita, you can go to uh, um, El Rey de, la, de las Fritas. El Rey de las Fritas. Or El Rey de la Frita. I don't know if it's singular frita or <clears throat> plural frita. El Rey de la Frita. Havana Harry's is pretty good. I haven't been there in a minute. My, 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 my sources tell me they've lost their touch a little bit. So I would go to La Carreta. It's old school. Um, but I would go to, um, I would go to, they closed La Palma too. Like all these changes in Miami that no one's even asking me for permission for. It's just very rude. Hey, uh, all, all hearing you pronounce all these names is reminding me very big missed opportunity this week when we were in Manhattan, right around, right around the corner from our hotel were a number of, uh, Cuban restaurants. Uh, man, I've never been to a Cuban restaurant with you, JC. And I feel like we need to do that. What Cuban restaurants were around the corner? There were at least three, at least three Cuban restaurants within within one block of our hotel. I saw them. So there's I was a around. oh, there was the one. There was one on the corner. There was one. On oh, there's the corner. one right yeah. there called Morgon. Morgon is like a sandwich, Cuban sandwich spot. Actually, is really good. I used to go there all the time back in the day. It's still there. And also, um, what is his name? Victor's Cafe. Victor's Cafe has been there forever because all these Cubans came in the early 60s. A lot of them went to Miami. Some went to New Jersey. This guy, Victor, opens up Victor's Cafe. They're great. By the way, Victor's Cafe is great. It's like touristy and like, you know, but it's fantastic. Victor's Cafe is great. Victor, it was so successful. Victor opened one in Miami, but it didn't work. Failed quickly because there were so many other Cuban restaurants. So Victor's Cafe... Um, you know, kind of blended in too much in Miami, but in New York, it's right across the street from Jersey Boys. So I don't know if the Jersey Boys is mm -hmm. still being played, but go to go to Victor's, go to Jersey Boys, a little Frankie Valley action. All right. Well, hey guys, listen, uh, before we jump off, I want to make sure that I have a chance to say shout out to Spencer and Mary for helping putting on a great uh portfolio accelerator out, event. Not out. only Thank for you. our clients, but <laughs> Even for us, the team, like it was great for us to get together, right? And and shout out to you, JC. I hate giving you shout outs, but shout out to you. You were one of the few people that could bring together that kind of crowd for a dinner. I mean, man, what a what a powerhouse of guests, man. Just great people, great energy, great ideas, just lots of positivity, just great people to be around. And uh, we all benefited from being there. So shout out, guys. Great job.
Thank you, Sean. You did a hell of a job yourself. And that Tuesday night dinner was was pretty awesome. There were some, it was awesome. some pretty heavy hitters there. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Dude, the food was awesome. I can't get over the food. I didn't yeah. think the food was going to be that good. I figured the food would be pretty good, but it was awesome. The, the, the food the food was great. I will say the, the lox in the morning was like borderline sashimi. It wasn't even lox. It was like sashimi. It was crazy. Fantastic. It was almost sushi. It was fantastic. I was like telling oh, yeah. everybody, I was like, get a big chunk and just... Yeah, I'm already like looking forward to Napa. Grade locks. Let's do it again. Anyway, all right. Yeah, next time in Napa, we'll we'll, we'll fill in fill in the details in a little bit. We'll let you guys know when that is uh, hammered out. But uh, it was a great event. Great seeing you all. Uh, we're glad to be back, though. Thanks to uh, for watching, everyone. Thanks to our guest today, Mike Singleton. We'll be back tomorrow with the full crew. Uh, very excited for that. And uh, we missed you guys. Hope you missed us. Give us a like, please, and thank you. And go make some money. All right, go do it. Yolo responsibly. See you, everybody. Always. Adios. I can't take no loss. I don't even know what it costs. I hit the ground and it go.